right. Uh, good morning, everyone. No, not yet. Good morning, everyone. Not yet. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, can, you all, can you all hear me okay at the back there? I think I can hear it coming through now. That should be good. Um, just start to say welcome to everyone. Oh, you need to speak up a bit more at the back there. Okay. Uh, welcome to Learning Technologies. I'll just say that first of all. Um, and welcome to this session on what is possibly the holy grail of what we're all here for, which is behavioral change. Okay. Um, there's lots of tech and lots of content, lots of other ways of producing stuff that we can push out to people. But if they don't change the behaviors, well, it's possibly not going to work. So that's why we have uh, two groups of speakers here today um, to talk through it. First of all, I'll get you to stand up, David. We have David Perring from Fosway Group, which is uh, <laughs> Europe's leading HR analysts. Um, what David doesn't know about HR and L&D isn't worth knowing. Um, so uh, he's going to be running through the theory and, and practice behind that. But also we have from Standard Life Aberdeen, if I can get these three guys to stand up, we have Stuart Coyle, we have Peter Yarrow, and we have Colin Brown from Standard Life, who have been using this nudging technique to change the behaviors in their company and how they're going to explain how it's done and how it's been working. The good news is you don't have to listen to me for much longer. I do have to mention one little housekeeping thing, slight issue with the water. Um, apparently, all the loos on this floor are now out of order. Nothing to worry about, really. Um, but the loos downstairs on the first are OK. Um, the other thing to mention, there's no fire drill. And if there's a real one, there's no water anyway. So what the hell? Um, so, <laughs> so what I'm just going to do now is I'm, uh, sorry, I'm Matt Brewer, by the way. I should have introduced myself. Uh, I'm just going to pass you over straight away to, to David, who's going to run the, the first part of our session. Thanks, Matt. Um, that's fantastic. Oh, save the applause for after. <laughs> so what I was going to say is, um, We've got about 20 minutes. I've got a shed load of stuff to go through. So you'll be able to download the slides later anyway. But um, what I want to ask you as a question to start off with is, how easy do you find it to change? How easy do you find it yourselves to be different from where you, where you were maybe even a month ago? Um, I'm not sure how many of you might have made a New Year's resolution. Anybody make a New Year's resolution? Or are we too, pas that too passe? Three people committed to making a change in their life this year. Oh, what a disappointment. But is that because actually it's quite hard to change? And I think that's actually, it is hard to change. Because if we want to change our decisions, actually the odds are stacked against us sometimes. Um, this is a, a view of thinking how people, how people make decisions based on their thinking. And pretty much when things are very familiar, they act on habit. So you sort of go down the usual predictive routes. And when things are semi-familiar, we might sort of do a bit of a uh-huh sort of check. And it's only when things are very unfamiliar that we actually think about it really hard, occasionally. But overall, what tends to happen is we always try to revert back with our lazy brains. And that means quite often our decision making is quite poor, which is why I didn't manage to keep my New Year's resolution and do the amount of exercise I was supposed to do last week. But there we go. So actually, maybe we do need a little bit, help, bit of help okay, to make those changes in our behaviors. Maybe there's something that we need. And that sense of nudging is what this gentleman, um, Richard Thaler, wrote a book back in 2008 called Nudge. Um, and it was a guide, effectively, to improving decisions about health, wealth, and happiness. He's a behavioral econo econo I can't say it. economist. That's the right word. He's got nothing to do with learning. But there are some interesting behavioral um, thinking that I think we can apply to learning. And they do say that creativity is making unintended connections. So hopefully, there's a little bit of creativity in our presentation today. One interesting thing is just in terms of what of a definition of a nudge is, it's making a better decision without even realizing it. That's what they define it as in the book. And what's quite interesting is, I don't know how you could not recognize that an elephant was pushing at the backside, right? <laughs> but it may be subtle. Sometimes, maybe it's a, bit, a little less subtle. But the basis of it is, frequently, we make irrational decisions, and we have rational, illogical behaviors, smoking maybe being one, which are illogical choices. And it sounds a bit like Dr. Spock talking, but we know we are human. But what if, what if we can change people's behaviors and be positive in developing their thinking? And that was such an interesting question 
that back in 2009, the Cabinet Office in the UK commissioned this report from a bunch of very worthy academics about how um, people can influence decision making. And basically, they came up with this mnemonic, which is called Mindscape, which is one of the sort of underlying basis of how, to some extent, nudge theory sort of works in a way. And it may differ from what our, my colleagues speak a bit about later. But they said, the basis of it is that actually our decisions are based heavily on influenced by who communicates information. Our responses to incentives are shaped by predictable mental shortcuts. So strongly avoiding losses, which is why you go to the packet of crisps that's in the cupboard or the packet of biscuits, because they may not be there tomorrow. We are strongly influenced by what others do. So you follow the pack. We go with the flow with preset options. Our attention is drawn to what is novel and seems relevant to us. Our acts are often influenced by subconscious cues. Our emotional associations are, can powerfully shape our actions. So if I run over Matt's dog, he may disregard some of the things I say because he's got it in for me. So all these things start to play, and commitments, we seek to be consistent in our promises that we make when we make promises and we reciprocate acts. All these are behaviors that actually we revert to, and we act in ways that make us feel better about ourselves, usually. Okay? So, basically, nudging is about creating an architecture or a, a sense, of, sense of decisions that encourage you to make a more positive um, outcome for you, the environment, for others. And I think one of the interesting things is it's not about creating more choices, okay? And you may recognize this potentially as your LMS catalog, okay? Maybe you have got 9,000 options. So it's not about more choices, it's about encouraging the right choices. And it's not about making um, prohibiting things from happening either, so you don't exclude things. So, and, and, and Richard Fowler got the Nobel Prize, right, in 2017. And I think this is, must have been part of the Nobel Prize for stating the bleeding obvious, but this is in the book. So if you want to encourage people to do something, make it easy. But again, how easy do we make things in our learning? How many people have a login for their LMS? OK, <laughs> quite a few, really, isn't it? So have you made it easy? Probably not. So there's the sense of, and this, I think, captures the whole sense of what uh, a NUG ar architecture, uh, which is what they refer to in the book, is all about. So you have Homer Simpson, and everybody understands his predilection for donuts. And Naboo is very cunningly increased his choice, chance of choosing the right thing, which is the fruit, by putting them in the right place, which is close. And actually, this works. In restaurants where they put the salads first in schools, people pick up the salad first, because they don't want to get to the end of the queue and realize that they've missed out on something. So they always fill their plate first. So you can encourage people to make the right decisions without them even necessarily realizing it. And actually, they happen all the time, and they can be very simple. Now, and everybody has probably walked along the street looking at their phone and suddenly noticed it say, look right, and they've seen a taxi come towards them at high speed, which has no intention of stopping, okay? And then you get the joy of seeing your family later on in the evening, and they cheering with this appointment that you didn't hit you in the taxi, whatever it happened to be. So these subtleties can be all over the place, and we well know that once we've eaten something at lunch, we lose the ability to read, so actually having pictures <laughs> makes it much easier to put things in the right space. And actually, when it comes to good intentions, yeah, everybody in the room doesn't want an ocean full of plastic. We know there's more plastic than plankton in the oceans. So why the hell wouldn't we do that? But quite often we mix it all up and we don't want to go to landfill. So make the decision easier and force the right place. And actually, everybody loves polar bears. They don't want to see them starving in the Arctic. So why not put something which nudges people to make the right decision for themselves, others, and the environment? So is this going on? Now, this is probably aimed quite literally more at the gentleman in the room. And it was introduced into Schiphol Airport about 25 years ago. It is a urinal. And by putting an etching on the urinal, um, some people claim that spillage was reduced by 80%. Okay, now the guy who put it in, this guy called um, Reichart, believes it's lower than that, because people sometimes have attention deficit disorder to some extent. And, um, but he thinks 50% is the amount that they've reduced the spillage by. Now, and he says, as he says <laughs> in that quote at the bottom, but even that is still noticeable, right? So we can nudge people to do things. And these are very sort of trite sort of examples, but it shows how effective the right nudge in the right direction at the right time can be. And they talk about this phrase, liberal paternalism. So they don't want to preclude choices, but they want to encourage you to make the right choices. Okay? So it's all about the best choice, being making positive decisions. So 
in learning, who is the target for a choice architecture? Not my words, I'm trying to translate Richard Thaler's principles into learning. So who is the target? I think everybody can be a victim of your choice architecture. So it's not just about the learner, it can also be about the manager and peers, because effectively, each one of those represents part of your learning ecosystem. And what we know from research, which has been conducted all over the place, um, is that actually, whilst 90% of you delegate the actual delivery, or sorry, the, the responsibility for developing skills to managers as a result of your programs, when leaders look at that, they say actually only 50% of those 90% are any good at doing it. So actually, maybe we can encourage the right behaviors by adopting a nudge architecture in the way we do things. So it's not just about nudging the learner, it's about nudging peers, it's about managing teams, everybody who has a role in learning, especially if we take a, so a social view of learning, or actually by interplaying with people in their formal study groups, motivational communities of interest, wherever it happens to be, um, and think about that mind space, actually what we can do is push people to be more active learners. So, where should you be applying potentially nudge theory in learning? Now, my view is that you need to have a broad sense of learning if you want to nudge it. It's not just about being in your classroom or in your e-learning project. It's about thinking more broadly about an entire ecosystem which touches formal learning, all oh, the excitement, workplace learning, and collaborative learning. These are all opportunities for where we can place a choice architecture, make people, encourage people to make the right choices. What it's not about, in my view, is giving people a choice of, do I look at it on my small screen, or do I put it on my desktop? It's not necessarily about that. I think it's about thinking about the contexts that enable people to think about making better decisions. So it's not about thinking the learning format or the channel, it's about thinking process. It's about thinking about the learning process and how you can nudge people through it and, the, and looking at it that way. So we can think about um, that mind space in terms of personal learning, operational performance, strategic talent development. And I think that there's loads of different ways you might nudge people. And I've got three examples and I'm gonna go through some more a bit later on. Just if you haven't thought about this before, I, the way I think about operational learning is really the sort of learning that you do for new systems, new starters, new products, all those sorts of things which are day-to-day -day normal survival activities. So regulatory compliance, license to operate, continuous improvement, all these are the sorts of things that we see in operational learning. And the sorts of things you can do are training, you have social performance management, that's really having things like quality circles and things like that. Um, license to operate is really about um, achieving a particular level and getting a sign off from someone. Bite-sized learning, we know about performance support, performance optimization. All these things are things that you could think about nudging people to do or think about how that works. Now, the nudge itself can be very simple. And this is an example um, of a, a pilot. I shouldn't have put trial because that doesn't work in that sentence in that way. Um, but by the end of the pilot, not by his trial because he didn't actually cause all those deaths. Um, Gwande introduced this checklist, and the checklist, by the time they finished using it systematically in the hospitals through the World Health Organization, had reduced um, death rates by 47%. So it just asked the really simple questions all the way through. Now, this is something that pilots are very well aware of. It's something they do regularly. They always go through a checklist, because they're taught pretty much from day one in their pilot school that actually, my memory can be at fault, and if I don't go through the checklist, I will fall out of the sky. So it's really important that even these simple things that we may not necessarily think thought of as learning are nudges to re help us behave in the right way. Other examples, maybe think about future readiness. So think about talent development, how we prepare the business to be effective in maybe six months to three years' time is to think about talent development and think about all these different areas of talent development all the way, all the way from job families through to goal, job goals. Um, usually this is about um, training that's related to new organizations, strategic competencies, leadership. Um, it's about talent management, about career development. Now what's interesting to me, if I just pick on career development, for example, is we know that actually making, giving people positive statements can change their behavior. And one of the interesting things, if you go for, for a completely different world into hospitality, where they're trying to encourage you not, well, try, encouraging you not to keep on cycling through your towels, is that if you use a positive statement, 
that it suggests people recycle their towels, 35% of people recycle their towel, towels. But at the point when you make it linked to that Mindscape list and you think about a norm, actually that gets push, pushed up to 44%. So we can use that Mindscape thinking to encourage people potentially to think about their approach to personal development. So for example, and this is my made up example, if you start to use badging and micro badging in your organization and you start to find there's a correlation, then maybe you could suggest that actually 35% of people who completed or achieved at least two digital badges have increased their salary by more than the standard pay rate, if that's true. Again, that's trying to pick on both the um, sense of norm of people who are successful, but also loss aversion. So thinking about that Mindscape list actually can be potentially quite powerful. Now, I don't necessarily suggest you do that, but I think it's trying to use that thinking to, to stimulate different ways of thinking about how you might encourage people to think about their learning. And just in terms of personal learning, again, this is just a, a view of what personal learning can be in organizations. And the reason I've put this up is we tend to want all people to bring them whole, their whole selves to, to work. So by developing themselves more fully, actually, we get a more engaged individual. So we know that actually people don't always enroll themselves in personal development. Likewise, in organ donor um, membership, actually, that can be really low. Is anybody an organ donor in the room? That's pretty good. Better than in Germany, where they only have 9% sign up. But equally, if you go to Austria, they have a 99% sign up. And that's because in Austria, you have to opt out. So going with the flow, one of those options in that Mindscape list, actually we can encourage people to maybe think about personal development. So what would happen if you did give everybody a personal learning fund that they could spend through your system? And you let them start to let them know what they've been doing. So in terms of how far ahead other people are in the amount of study they've done. So there's people who are experimenting with that at the moment. But overall, I think one of my sort of senses of nudge theory and learning is that what we need to think is about how you look at learning. And I think lots of the things that I hear as I go around the stands downstairs and hear presentations is it tends to create a polarity in decision making between formal and informal, between courses and resources, between micro learning and long form learning, between social and self-directed, between programmatic and unstructured learning. It tends to be polarities, but I don't think they necessarily help us. And I haven't got time to talk you through this, but um, it's a little bit of a, I don't know if anyone's heard of Schrodinger's cat. You heard of Schrodinger's cat? Do look it up. Um, basically, the, in my view, if you set a learning person, a learning professional, uh, a task to say, I want you to be able to fly this glider in a week's time. Choose your learning approach. According to Schrodinger, when you put the person in, that, um, in the capsule, so to speak, and launch them out, they're both alive and dead at the same time. That's quantum physics, right? Because you don't know if they're going to crash or not. So one of the interesting things is, I believe if you had to go through a process I think you'd be worried less about the content, but you'd be more in interested in the practice and also the feedback you got as you were going through learning actually how to do it practically. I think if somebody gave you 40 hours of micro-learning to go through, or e-learning, you would be not wanting to get into that capsule at 10,000 feet and be let loose, because you'd want to act actively practice. Okay? So thinking about a process, something that enables you to understand um, I think it's one of, one of the things that's really important to help you understand how you can nudge learning, okay? So if you think about um, learning as a process or a cycle, I think it makes more sense if you think about it as a process. And what I mean by that is actually each one of these things can be a nudge because actually to do an assessment, a periodic, periodic assessment or a task 360, maybe doing some quality assessment feedback, maybe using performance metrics, maybe using performance management or assessments, whatever it happens to be, all those give you a point of engagement which trigger you to do the next stage, which is to think, okay, we know where you are, what are we gonna do about it? And at the point when you think about analyzing, automating recommendations, professional reviews, coaching reviews, uh, manager reviews, each one of these things is potentially a nudge in that journey and something you can think about pushing people to do. 
in terms of their learning experience. And equally, in terms of developing a plan, thinking about learning itself, actually, each time you push things to people or encourage them to make a positive decision, maybe not give them an opt-out rather than an opt-in, actually, I think you can drive them to behave in a way that they continuously develop. And I think one of the interesting things to me is actually we focus so much on the acquisition, we do forget to nudge people to practice, we do forget to nudge them to do, which is a very simple way of thinking about a blend, because we focus so much on delivering knowledge and, not, and delivering skills, but actually it's the application of those which is really important. So things, again, that are maybe the opportunity to nudge are about learning journals, having blogs, having job assignments, thinking about manager observations, coaching, all these things are almost a way of creating a maybe a more active blend for how we look at a learning journey. And every time we think about a learning journey and a learning process, actually we have the opportunity to nudge people, to push them on to the next step. I and mean, if you think about 70, 20, 10, it doesn't make sense to me about how you'd nudge people from 70 to 20 to 10. I think if you start to think about it as a process, it becomes quite real. And it doesn't have to be system-based. It doesn't have to be content-based. It can be something which is actually about prompting the next point, which motivates somebody to complete their action the right way. So sustain just completing the cycle, which takes you back to measure. So one of the interesting things for me is who's doing that in the marketplace today. Um, invariably, nobody is, because nudge is not something that is widely seen as being something that platforms or content providers actually do at the moment. It's something that you would need to do if you wanted to pick up that sort of thinking, ultimately. So you've got some great innovators to, to talk a little bit later. But I think it's something that can come. Um, this is our drawing, effectively, of mapping the evolution of learning systems way back, which is pretty much when most of them started to appear back in 1996, all the way out to 2020. And I think there's this sort of shift towards relationship management, engagement, gamification. These are some of the things that you'd effectively find as being relevant to nudge in some form or another. But it won't be unless you as a community, as an audience, start to demand these sorts of functionalities that they will appear. Most of the vendors are relentlessly driven by trying to provide what the customer needs. Sometimes they go out on a limb and provide innovation, but invariably it's driven by you. So do think about demanding some of these things that support nudging a learning process, nudging a learning journey. Um, I think most people need some structure behind them to enable them to navigate, and that's what you can provide to some extent by offering um, a sense of nudge and a sense of journey, a sense of process. So there are a list of vendors that I've picked out that I'm aware of are doing things around nudge. Um, this is by no means comprehensive. I have no commercial relationship with these guys. Um, but nobody really supports learning cycles, which is odd. Um, but if you've got an example of somebody who's doing nudge, I'd be really interested. The stuff that Actium are doing with Channel 4, really interesting. Cross Knowledge has some really interesting things around gamification, which nudge people to go through their blended learning programs. Filters have started to do some amazing things with um, adaptive learning. Filtering the content to the individual. Again, that's a nudge to put people in the right direction, especially if you follow up on it. Um, Saffron had got some amazing things they're starting to release around um, guided performance support, which is incredible. Exonified their interval reinforcement, which is a, a, a form of nudge in a way. But nobody's really got a, a coherent way. Ludic do, do, do some amazing things in terms of blended learning. Growth engineering, their gamified LMS, have been doing stuff for a long time. Um, Fuel50, they have a creative development platform which works very much on a, a nudge format, um, encouraging you to go through each step to diagnose your drivers and then think about the roles that you're looking for in your terms of your future. Um, IBM got some incredible things they're doing with Watson at the moment. Um, Corp Academy do shootouts, which is quite interesting. So you challenge somebody else in your organization to compete around how well you know something. So it seems to be pockets of practice rather than something that's coming widely. Um, just pick out Lumes, they're doing something around personal benefits packages. There's an organization called Learnerby doing the same sort of thing around curating content which you have a fund to spend. And there's also a SEMA who've just recently talked about their relationship with chatbots and IBM, which is really quite interesting as well. So but it's not something that's pandemic, pandemic out there, it's something that's evolving. So does anybody have a hope in hell of, of using Nudge? In my view, I think it's a big opportunity. I think everybody can do it, because it's not dependent on 
technology. It's dependent on a way of thinking. It's a, a mindset. It's not about um, buying a piece of technology that enables you to do it, although you might do some of that. But I think one of the interesting things, and this comes out of our research that we did with LTG, that we're part of the work, sorry, L, the learning um, group who organize uh, the, the forum here, the Learning Technologies. Basically, we do, through our survey, and we're part of the way through it, what fascinates me, and maybe you can't read this, but I'll talk you through it, each one of these bars represents um, how often organizations support learning uh, through each stage of a learning cycle. So it picks on things from continuously measuring individuals' needs through to supporting individuals' learning decisions about what and what they, where they can learn, enabling learning development planning for individuals, multi-channel learning, and I want to fall off the edge, supporting employees' application of learning on the job, sustaining individuals' learning in the workplace, and measuring learning, and then energizing learning to develop future expertise and mastery. What's interesting is up to here, um, in the green, that light green, is often. So what amazes me is actually most of the opportunities, maybe even for nudging, around supporting employees' application of learning and sustaining individuals' learning in the workplace is the lowest focus for learning teams. Now, to me, that's really scary because the fact that only a third of organizations support learners' application and learning in the workplace, only a third sustain their learning in the, learning in the workplace, and more than 55% consistently measure progress, means that actually quite often, when learners are at the biggest point of need, they are completely abandoned. But potentially that's where you need to build in most of the social connections and the relationship to drive more effective learning and get real business results. And I think it's, it's, it's a massively important thing that it's not about 70-20-10, it's about powering people to continuously improve. And unless we're thinking about a learning process that reaches beyond the classroom, which despite maybe 15 years of 70-20-10 and people talking about blended learnings doesn't seem to have had that much impact, it's something we really need to address. So I'll put nudge up there as a way of thinking that might encourage you to increase the amount of learning that we offer, or support for learning that we offer, all the way through to building competence and expertise. So, oops, <laughs> I knew that was gonna happen. <laughs> so, I think the biggest challenge for LND is not about forgetting curves, it's about supporting, I got the biggest laugh just as I fell off the stage. <laughs> Slapstick, <laughs> lovely. Um, so the biggest challenge for LND is not about forgetting curves in my view. It's about improving and building expertise and effectiveness. It's about helping people continuously get better and apply their skills. It's about changing behaviors, and we don't do that just by filling people's minds with content. And I think if we think about um, learning in a creative way and start to apply new behavioral economics thinking, or old economics thinking in a way, because it's 10 years old now, to what we do, maybe we can drive better behaviors and provide better learning outcomes, because that's what we're probably in the game for. So in my view, what should you take away? Yes, a nudge is about making a better decision without even noticing it. I think we can nudge learners to be better learners. Um, do think about learning journeys. If you were in marketing, in the marketing world, you'd be thinking about each learner as a customer, and you'd think about each engagement point, each time you touch that customer as an opportunity to drive more and more consumption. And what we do is we use the data that we have around those individuals to personalize that experience and drive more and more engagement. And that's a fantastic opportunity. But at the point when you have that data and you know where you want to put, take them, actually you have an opportunity to use those Mindscape elements to nudge them on to the next step to make them effective, because we know cycles are important. And I think the, the fresh th thing for me is that I think nudge may be a way just to chuck it out there as a fresh way of thinking about blended learning, just think about it freshly, because it can get a bit stale when you're just trying to put things in a 70-20-10 box. And we can think about actually not building around the content obsession, but thinking about a learner journey ex ex effectively, which means that we're reaching out and touching them with managers at the right point. We're encouraging them to talk to peers at the right time. We know that they haven't looked at something for a while, so we push something to them. 
and take a proactive action. And I, a years ago, people started talking about, my, I suppose, learning campaigns. And I think that's something that maybe we should invest a little, a little bit more effort in again. But think about those touch points. Think about engaging people, whether it's about the operational learning, whether it's about personal learning, whether it's about that strategic development of people. Let's think about how we can nudge them. Um, there's such an opportunity out there. So that's me. I think I'm hopefully sort of on time-ish. Um, we've got some questions that we can take at the end, but I'll transition over. Thanks, Matt. I've hopefully not taken up all the oxygen. Thank okay. you. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, round of applause, I think, for David. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll, we'll do all the, um, the questions um, at the end. Um, once we have our, our second group of speakers, who are uh, Carmen, Peter, and Stuart from Standard Life Aberdeen, who have actually been putting some of this into practice. So uh, we'll just get the uh, presentation swapped over. Guys, if you'd like to take the stage. <laughs> Without falling off it. I shouldn't have said that, should I? <laughs> We're going to be doing a double act down the pub later on. Um... Okay, and now uh, I'll hand you over to Peter. Thank you. Um, I didn't actually realise computer learning technologies were so uh, dangerous. <laughs> I'm not even an old girl. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, great to be here. And um, as Matt said, I'm Peter Yarrow. I work for Standard Life Aberdeen. Um, I joined the company just over a year ago when it was still Standard Life. Uh, for those of you um, in the audience, I don't know how much you know about the company, but it's an investment company. It uh, looks at pensions and savings, it's fund management, it's a global operation. Uh, I went, went through a merger in the middle of last year, um, which I wasn't anticipating when I joined the company, but that's, that's one of those things. Um, now, when I joined the company, which you know, met, is, there's so many positives I see about the organization, but one thing that was really um, clear was that from an L&D point of view, more needed to be done. Uh, well, why would I say that? Well. Um, the feedback from colleagues around their access to personal and professional growth, career development, you know, they had a negative perception compared to what I'd experienced in previous companies. Uh, as I started to look at the learning environment, it was I found that it was really difficult to nav navigate around learning. It's difficult to find things. It's like finding a needle, you know, looking for anything useful. It was like finding a needle in a haystack. And a lot of the time, people were defaulting to classroom learning even though we had great, um, you know, in some cases, world-class digital learning resources, they were being completely underutilized. People wanted to go in the classroom. It's probably a familiar story. And the way it felt for me at that time, a year ago, was as if, if, it, if learning development was a, a jigsaw, it was just like someone had pulled all the pieces back up, thrown them in the box, shook them around, and then shoved them back out on the table. It felt you know, really hard. Uh, but, but a couple of things happened. One of them was actually exactly a year ago today uh, when Stuart and I came to the Learning Technologies Conference. And we came to one of these sessions. I actually think one of them was in this room. And we saw uh, a company talking about how, how they'd worked with digital learning. And actually, it was with one of the companies we also worked with. And then Stuart went along to another session and saw almost exactly the same thing, another organization achieving great results working with a company that we also worked with. So it made us ask the question, if they can do that, why can't we? The second thing that happened was I went along to a session a couple of weeks later held by Towards Maturity. And actually, the, the, one of the companies was named up there is a, a guy called Owen Rose from Action Learning. And he talked about how organizations were using nudging to influence the behavior of their audience. None of it was L&D related. It was all, you know, some of the examples that David showed earlier on, but other things as well. One of the, the most famous ones I've heard about is the way that the government changed the way it communicated with taxpayers to get them to complete their tax returns on time, uh, which has you know, brought a huge amount of uh, money into, into the country um, quicker, I suppose. So using sort of different techniques to get people to change their behavior. Now, he used an acronym during that session, EAST, Easy, Attractive, Social, and Timely. So easy, you know, removing all the barriers, attractive by offering incentives, 
making it a social thing, and also making sure that what you're doing is relevant at the right time. It made me think about, well, how can I, in standard life, soon to be standard life Aberdeen, make learning easy, attractive, social, and timely? So what you're going to hear about is how we've gone about that. And you know, with the number of things we've done over the past 12 months, uh, having seen what David's just talked about, it's definitely not perfect. And there's still a long way for us to go. But what we can talk about is what we have done, what we've experienced, and what the, the sort of results are that we're achieving. And we've done this with quite limited resource, not a lot more money, um, just a lot of, I suppose, imagination and to some extent creativity about what we could do in our organization. So on that point, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Stuart. Thanks very much, Peter. Hi, everyone. Um, my first role when I joined um, Standard Life in, in 2016 was to, uh, was to launch a, a leadership development programme for all of our, our people managers. Um, and that was a four-module programme, so four one-day workshops. And as we started to, to get to the end of the programme, um, we thought about, well, how could we keep that learning journey going? How could we uh, provide leaders with access to really good relevant materials and, and keep that conversation going about development. So that, that was the, the challenge for us. So we started to think about digital um, and, and we could see the value of, um, of making those resources available using the, the digital medium. Um, we worked with a number of suppliers. Um, we, so we worked with Get Abstract, um, Good Practice, Skillsoft and also Harvard. But a lot of those sites were really underutilized. So some of those were used in certain pockets of the business. Um, and really, we hadn't pushed that content out to anybody or really made um, people aware that, that those opportunities existed to any, to any great extent. And as Peter said, we had come along to Learning Technologies a, a year ago, and we heard from organizations like Edrington and Lloyds Banking Group about the success that they had had with organizations that we were already partnered with. So what did we do? Well, we spoke to Good Practice. What you see in front of you there is, uh, is their toolkit. Um, we had worked with Good Practice for around seven years or so, um, as was typical of the relationships we had with our, our partners. That site was also underutilized. We were using an old version of it, um, and we'd been with them for a good few years. So we saw that being a really good opportunity to point leaders towards that site uh, and make all those resources available to them. We decided to call it our learning portal. Um, so that's the brand that we, we adopted and we started, we started communicating that. Um, and we also engaged with our other um, partners and we encouraged them to share resources and, and host those resources on our learning portal. So it was, became a bit of a, a one-stop shop for our, for our leaders. So what did they get access to? Well, they got access to lots of really good resources. So little articles, video clips, uh, audio clips, research, book summaries, video summaries, etc. So it's a, a, wealth of, a wealth of information. Um, and we started to get really good, really good feedback on that. Um, it was important because it opened up a, a channel for us. We'd, prior to that point, we'd never had a direct channel out to all the leaders within the organization. So it gave us the opportunity to open up that channel, communicate with them directly about stuff that was really, we felt was, was really relevant and was linked to the program I talked about earlier on. Um, but that was just the, the, the start, and we knew that if we launched a site, we would have to give people a reason to keep, to keep um, coming back. So with that in mind, we came up with a, a, a new approach um, to, to keep people returning. So we talked with our stakeholders um, across the business about the topics that were really important. So what were the subjects that were really front of mind that we would want to share with, that, with, with those leaders? Um, and we came up with something called the, the Leading Edge Spotlight On, and that's what you're seeing in front of you just now. Um, in essence, uh, we launched it in June last year, and it's, a, it's an email, and we make life really, really simple for people. So we provide access to uh, digital resources, to video content, 
to short articles. And as you can see on the right hand side as you look at the screen, that's the sort of format there. So a bit of an intro um, and, and links to and links to different pieces of, of content. Um, so one month, for example, have spotlight on diversity and inclusion, the following month it might be spotlight on coaching and so on and so forth. And we've delivered eight of them so far. Again, we kept those partnerships going and we invited our partners to sort of share the best content that they had available and that we could then use as, as, part, of, as part of Spotlight On. So in terms of what leaders get access to, they get this simple email on a monthly basis full of hand-picked digital resources. Uh, we adopt a less is more principle, so we try and keep it as, as, uh, as short and as sweet as, as possible. Uh, the videos are a couple of minutes, the article might take you five minutes, and we're really explicit about that as, as, as well. So we tell people how long it's going to take to do each part of, of Spotlight On. And we feel that it's really ta tailored and relevant, so it's linked directly into topics and subjects that are really important to the business, and, uh, and by extension, really important to, to leaders as well. So why is it important? Well, it's, it's opened up uh, a, a channel, again, for us to communicate directly uh, with people. It encourages them to come back to our sites uh, and use our resources time and time again. And we encourage people to then, uh, leaders to then share uh, with our teams. So in terms of the result, it's proved to be really popular. Um, we've grown the distribution list from 1,100 when we started out. Now there are now 6,000 people who, who receive um, the leading edge spotlight on, so it's, it's grown in, in popularity. Um, and individuals and business areas, and recently a, a division has asked it to, to come on board. Um, so we're now up to 6,000, and we're taking steps towards reaching all 9,000 of our employees across the, the entire organization. So when we launched um, the, the sites with, uh, with the Good Practice Toolkit, um, it's based on their standard build, so it's really easy to get around, really easy to navigate, um, you can find resources. Um, but we felt there was an opportunity to build on that and complement what was already there with their own curricula. So we started the process of, of developing curricula based on, again, topics that were important. We engaged with the organisation to say what's front of mind right now and kept that conversation going. And so we started to um, build, build these. The first one we built was career and personal development, resilience and well-being, effective teams, you can see on the screen there. And also um, the final one was great conversations. Again, we partnered uh, with, with those um, suppliers to pull together all the, the content. And we also commissioned and created a whole series of new content as well. So we've added infographics, we've added new colleague videos, We've added toolkits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it really has grown. Um, so leaders get access to um, all of these additional resources. We've extended it. So now that we're going out to 6,000 people, and you'll hear more about another campaign from Carlin later on, we've gone out to an old colleague audience, which was a really key step for us. So we've extended it out to, to all colleagues. And within each one of the curricula, you can see in front of you there, there are around. 40 digital resources, and that's a really good, there's a good variety of stuff in there. Infographics, videos, challenges, toolkits, etc. So it's a nice, we feel it's a, a, a nice mix. And um, it's given us a home as well through our learning promotions and our campaigns and our marketing activity. We can point people directly to those um, curricula so they can find out more about their career and personal development or resilience and so on and so forth. So we've received really good feedback. Um, and we've extended the, the readership, which has been really, really key for us. Um, so whilst we're on the subject of engaging learners, um, I'd like to pass you over to Carolyn, who's going to talk about a really important campaign we launched in October last year. Thanks. Hi. So I joined Standard Life Aberdeen on the graduate scheme last September. And when I joined, it was a really interesting time because Standard Life and Aberdeen Asset Management were merging, creating one of the largest investment companies in Europe and a massive change for colleagues. So we were presented with a challenge from our people leadership team to deliver a learning initiative that would support colleagues through the early stages of integration and help shape the behaviours that were needed during times of change. And this presented us with a few challenges as a learning team 
because we had two organizations and two cultures coming together with no shared learning, no shared systems, and an audience of 9,000 colleagues across different parts of the world. So digital felt like a good way to start addressing some of these um, challenges and using a campaign style of approach. And we wanted to create something that was easy, attractive, social, and timely. So there was a number of things that were at the very heart of this. Firstly, a simple user experience and a look and feel that was reflecting the new organization and its brand. Secondly, we wanted to share colleagues' stories and experiences from both heritage organizations and across global locations. And we wanted subject matter that was relevant to anyone, no matter where they came from. So from this, the Leading Edge Challenge series was developed. And this is a 20-week learning campaign based around the concept of weekly nudges, which prompts colleagues to engage with learning in short bursts and try simple challenges and activities. So to make sure we were providing something that was really relevant to colleagues, we based the campaign around an employee culture survey. So this meant aligning our content with the cultural traits that colleagues said they wanted to see within the new merged company. And from the 20 top traits that came out of the survey, we distilled it down to five key themes that you can see at the bottom of the slide. So what do our colleagues get access to? Well, they get access to a weekly email based around one of those five key themes that you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. This features a video of colleagues talking about their experiences around that theme and a challenge to encourage colleagues to do something different. The email also links to some additional bite-sized resources hosted on our learning portal that you can see on the left-hand side of the screen. And each week, we update the learning portal homepage with other resources to further support the theme that week. Colleagues also have access, um, have the opportunity to enter into a competition and to win prizes based on how they've engaged with the campaign. So how did we go about this? Well, we worked really closely with good practice to design the email, conduct the interviews, and to create the challenge series collateral. And we interviewed over 50 colleagues from across global locations, including Singapore, Brazil, the US, and the UK. And using our colleagues in the videos was really important because it enabled colleagues to share, learn from each other and encourage people to share their knowledge and their experience. And the challenges were designed with the input of a business psychologist to be simple but effective in helping to support the behavior and culture that colleagues said they wanted to see within the organization. So, what were our guiding principles? Well, we wanted to use digital to help support behavioral change during the merger. But we also wanted to provide colleagues, no matter of heritage organization, with easily accessible materials to support their learning and development at a time when they really needed it. We also wanted to respond positively to the employee culture survey and to support the culture of the new organization by showcasing colleagues from both heritage organization and highlighting the importance of creating a, an inclusive culture during the early stages of integration. So what challenges did we over, have to overcome? Well, we had to be really careful that the messages conveyed in the campaign were sensitive enough to the fact that people were going through a really tough time and were at risk of losing their jobs, but still challenging enough to support the new culture of the organization. We also had to make sure that we had a good representation of colleagues from both heritage organizations, as well as across gender, ethnicity, and age, while still featuring the best quality videos in the campaign each week. And this, again, was really important in helping to create an inclusive culture in the organization. So now that I've told you about the, how we've made the campaign easy, attractive, and timely, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the social elements. We believe that talent attracts talent, and we saw the challenge series as an opportunity to not only showcase our colleague videos and challenges internally, but to use our social media platforms to promote them externally as well. In promoting the colleague videos on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, we're able to bring the inside out and show what our values are and what the culture inside the organization is like. And our hope is that this acts as a catalyst to attract new talent to the organization. 
So far, our social media campaign has been fairly successful, with LinkedIn and Facebook reaching the most amount of people. And in total, we've reached 146,000 people across both platforms. And what we've noticed as the campaign has progressed is the reach on each post has increased, and the subtopics that have received the most attention have been those that are relevant in any sector, like find one thing you love about your job and manage your optimism. So have we seen the change we wanted to create? Well, as we reach the halfway point of the challenge series, it feels like a good time to reflect on our progress so far. And I'd like to pass you back to Peter to tell you how we got on. OK, so um, I guess at the heart of all of this was how we change behavior within our organization. Has easy, attractive, social, and timely helped us do that? Uh, so we'll take a look at some of the data that we've got. So this is in terms of how we've seen a change in engagement with digital content through the way we've actually applied it using these nudge techniques. So just to try and explain some of this to you, um, 2017 versus 2016, the blue line uh, that you can see shows the, the volume of um, content being used. Between the two years, we've increased the usage of content by six times. We've actually increased the number of users by eight times. That's just by taking a very different approach to how it's used, how it's promoted, making sure it's relevant, et cetera. I think at the heart of all this is how do you make it really easy to get to? There's something on here you can't see, though, which is, and it's more in the numbers, which is about how then the content's being used. So what we were able to see historically was that there was a quite a high bounce rate, so people clicking straight off the site after they viewed one page. We've now started, that bounce rate was something like 48% in 2016. 2017, it was 3%. So again, we think that by being really targeted and making sure the content that we're putting out there is relevant, people are spending more time. And we can also see that in terms of some of the other elements around usage. So for example, while we may have reduced the average session time by about 30 seconds, rather than paging through lots of different uh, resources, people are spending the time maybe on the videos or the articles that we're putting out there. So we're definitely seeing a change in terms of learning behavior, at least. The other question though is how we actually change behaviors in line with what we want to see from our new culture. It's actually too early to say. We've not, actually, we've not measured that at this point. We're roughly halfway through that program uh, of work. And we'll shortly be starting interviews and surveys with colleagues across the organization to ask them, you know, what difference has this made to you? What are you doing differently? How has this supported you in, uh, through the change, but also in your job? So we want to be able to demonstrate this is actually making a difference to our colleagues. So we've learned a lot from this. Um, and after hearing David earlier, I think there's a hell of a lot more we need to learn. Um, but there's some of the key things around, you know, once you start this, you can't really stop. You, don't, you saw there at the end of last year a dip. Now, we actually paused the campaign for Christmas in December. So we naturally saw less people going to the site. So you need to keep it going all the time. Um, we also feel that we could have done more to prepare the organization for what we were about to launch. There was some communication. But I think there's more around how do we educate managers about how they can use this with their teams, whether it's part of a team uh, meeting or as part of development conversations. So we, we felt that we could provo provide maybe more advice and guidance around this. Um, and the last point on there is back to how do we actually keep it going in a sustainable way? We're not a big team. Carlin actually finishes with us in a couple of weeks' time. Um, there's three of us in, our, in the learning function. This is quite resource intensive, but through automation, what we think we can do is not only start to promote the content that's relevant for the organization, but as we also introduce single sign-on, which will be coming shortly, we'll also be able to use that data to uh, personalize some of the content as well. So you're getting something from the organization, but something based on what, what you might be interested in as well. So a huge amount to do. As I said, great start, but the work never really ends. And I, I guess you know we, we've got a long way to go. I definitely will take a lot from what you've said earlier on, David. But I hope it's been interesting. Uh, and I hope this has been useful for you. I'm going to hand back to Matt. Thank you. OK, well, thank you to the, the team from Standard Life Aberdeen, and thank you to David as well. 
Um, we've now got a, a few minutes for questions, whether you want to ask about the, the theory and practice, whether you want to ask about the case study, or even David's ability at parkour. You can ask, uh, answer anything you like. Um, so, yes. Ah, yes. So, the Fosway Group research as well, some, some takeaways you can, you can get from there. So, um, yeah, we have a few minutes for some questions. So, uh, would anyone like to, to start off with a question? If not, I can always start off with one. Um, for, the, for the team from Standard Life, uh, Aberdeen, I know you mentioned about using external things like LinkedIn and, uh, and Twitter and Facebook, etc. Did you have any issue with marketing and communications in your company about using those channels? Uh, we had um, issues internally about even going out direct to colleagues, not only going externally, but we have got... Um, we do have someone who, who works around our LinkedIn profile, particularly spe specifically from the talent and OD function. Is the, the guy who looks after employer brand and attraction. So we were able to use his experience of how he'd got content out there and work with him. Uh, we had to add Z clauses to the end of videos and all this sort of legal stuff, but uh, we managed to get there. We, it was, in the end, probably a little bit easier than we'd anticipated. Okay. It's a great story, Peter. I guess the question is, any tips on how you got budget to do something like this? Was, it, was this over and above what you currently have? Yeah. We, how, what kind of tips could you share? Yeah, so we, we did get a little bit of money. It wasn't a lot. Um, so because we were presented with this challenge, we basically costed it all out in terms of how much it would cost to do the videos. Um, the additional collateral, rebranding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of the um, curation, because we didn't do all the curation internally. We just don't have the resource. Um, we, we, we had to go and present to our people leadership team, took them through how we could use digital in our organization, what our idea was. And um, Stuart and I did that. And again, it, it, we were anticipating something really tough. We actually went in to say, we're going to send us something out every day for the first 100 days of the organization, which I'm glad we didn't in the end do that. Uh, but but um, yeah, 20, 20 is enough. Um, so they bought that idea. We, we, were, we were amazed that we got agreement to an email a day for 100 days, but we eventually settled on one per week. So the amount of money, it wasn't a huge amount. We're talking tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands. And um, I think a lot of it was the, the buy into what they'd already seen through what Stuart talked about was the start of the leading edge with the spotlight on emails and the success they'd seen and the feedback they'd had. Um, so they felt that, you know, then taking it a step further, introducing colleagues into that, them sharing their stories was just a good way of, uh, particularly within a, within a global organization, of getting learning out there, but also helping the, the culture of the organization too. Um, hi, I'm just wondering, have you thought about, is this only in English, or have you thought about other languages as well? Uh, we did have to test out whether we would need to have translation, and the response was no. Um, even though we've got global locations, it's predominantly an English-speaking business, uh, so we didn't have to in the end, but we did anticipate that, yeah. yeah. I think it was a great example of um, how to get people to interact with learning and, and measuring that, but have you done any steps to measure how people have actually used that learning to change the, the way they're working? That's, that's the thing that's coming next for us. So we're going to be doing interviews and surveys to understand what difference has it actually made. Are you doing anything differently? Yeah, because you're right, it is, you know, it's purely about getting people to use the learning. That in itself was a challenge in the first place. But the next thing is, is it making a difference? And I think that's something that you know, pretty much everything I've ever done in learning development, it's, do, you ever, do we ever go to that stage? And with this one, we definitely do want to, to, to see that. Uh, and then I suppose that's the proof of has it been successful? Yeah. Um, I just wonder with regard to the videos, you talked about 20 weeks, that's 20 videos minimum. Did mm -hmm. you self select the people you wanted for those videos, or how did you go about getting them? We've always found it a bit of a challenge to get yeah. those coming in on that frequency. Yeah. Um, we actually did half of the videos we, were done within a two week period, and we had two weeks to get that organized. 
Um, we were working with Good Practice and they said, all right, so we've got the plan and you have to start filming in two weeks' time. And we didn't have anyone. We didn't have any rooms booked in order to do the filming. Um, so that, well, we were meeting every day, weren't we, Stuart? And Stuart yeah. is a really good program manager and there's a, another guy working with us at that time. And every day we'd go into this room and me and Scott would go, we've got an extra two people today. And Stuart would be like, no, that's not good enough. We're never going to get there. Anyway, we, we did actually go through our HR colleagues uh, who went out to their you know, leaders and et cetera. But we, we were really clear we needed a mix of people. So we were going through engagement groups that we got set up and networks within the organization uh, and dragging people in, basically. We, we, gave them, we didn't script them. We gave them um, almost like a brief. It's like, this is what we want you to talk about from your point of view and your experience. And then you spent usually about an hour filming, and out of that film, uh, an hour of filming, we usually got maybe two, sometimes three videos out of those. So we, while we only videoed 50 people in total, we got about 100 videos um, in, in, in totality. Uh, the other challenge was obviously the international side because that came a little bit later. And we even had to hire companies to do the videoing in other countries and set, Actually, the biggest challenge was getting them set up on our payroll systems. That was the hardest bit. <laughs> yeah. um, in the end, we, end, we were paying them by, by a PayPal. <laughs> it, was like, it was easier than trying to get them set up. So, but I think you're right. Sometimes it can be difficult to get people to do the videos. But we, we were really overwhelmed by how supportive people were. No, we didn't, no. Um, we thought that might have been taking things a step too far at this point in time. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, you said it, the, the um, spotlight on, the leadership meeting edge part, yeah. created much better um, feedback from your yeah. managers to you. Yeah. And what about between them? Because all of you are just on one, one side. Yeah. When we do management and practice trainings, we tend to get bring them together in small groups and a lot of yeah. the benefit is about sharing experiences yeah. with each other. Yeah. Was there an interactive part? No, not, not, not at all. And that's, I suppose that's the thing that we say, yeah, we, we don't have those, we could bring them together face to face, but we'd have to organize all of that or we could encourage them to. What we find is often, because um, on the back of the last workshop, which Stuart talked about in the, in the personal best program, we did actually try and encourage people to form working, like action learning sets. Uh, but they needed a lot of prompting, so a lot of those didn't happen. Uh, and through the technology, we weren't able to, to support that. It's a, it is a good idea, and I wish we could do it. Uh, it would be one of those things that we'd see as a, you know, an evolve, yeah, an evolution of what we do, yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Um, what topics did people click on the most? Um, Colin, do you know what topics did people choose the most? Um, stand up. Um, I think resilience and well-being was probably the most talked about. So we've got a lot of resources um, around that topic. But also um, career and personal development. We did actually, interestingly, see um, male colleagues tended to talk about different topics than female colleagues. Um, so we actually struggled with diversity and inclusion. We don't have um, that many resources around that. I think just maybe because it's a, a more difficult to, uh, topic to talk about, but I say resilience and well-being is probably the most talked about one. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, any other questions that we can field? All right. How much of the content you have on the portal is new, and how much of it was repurposed um, from existing catalogues? Uh, hmm. Can you answer that? Yeah. Um, for, uh, for, for Spotlight On, um, most of it already exists. Sorry, who asked the question? Oh, yeah. Um, so most of it e existed already on our, um, on our good practice portal and through our other partners. So we do look there first, um, but we can't always find a, a match. So sometimes we'll look externally. So we used um, TED Talks, for example, where there's a really nice fit. So it's a combination. I would say it's probably 75% 
of stuff we already have um, access to, and about 25% we, we look elsewhere. Um, so it, it takes quite a bit of work to pull it together, to be honest. There's quite a lot in terms of the curation and making sure the quality's right and it all flows and has a good mix. So there's a fair bit of work to it, but um, it, it does seem to land quite well. Thanks. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question, if there's one more from the, the floor. Ah. If this is a good introduction, what book would you recommend so we can dive deeper? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, I didn't. This is a lovely introduction. Maybe there's a book you can recommend so we can really explore yeah. deeper. Yeah. The, the book I read was called Inside the Nudge Unit. And I can't remember who wrote it. Inside the what? Nudge Unit. Nudge Unit. Yeah. And it, it was specifically about the, the way the government brought together this behavioural unit. And that's when I read about yeah, how uh, they used that to then change the way they communicated to taxpayers through the letters and, and various other communications. I think some of the things that, I mean, we've not used this, we've, we've tried it in, in other ways, but one of the things they talk about now is always saying 98% you know, of people do this. So by saying most people do this, it becomes, it's therefore more socially acceptable for you therefore to do it as well. So you have to be really careful with your data. If you say 30% of people do this, you go, oh, well, only 30% do it, therefore I don't need to do that. So I think there's, there's things like that in there that we should read about. We actually, I've actually on our, we've got a little social feed on our intranet, which again is underutilized, I'd say, but we, we need to do more of that. And I've actually tried saying, you know, X thousand colleagues, I've read this book summary. And then I've gone to say, get abstract and said, did you have anyone read this book summary today or sign up to the service? And they said, oh yeah, we noticed 20 odd people signed up today. So we can see that there are examples, little things you can do but you have to make the time to do that. And, and again, it's a, where, do we need to, where do we want to put our effort at each point? But we, we've, we've talked a lot more around using the channels, haven't we, in the organization. Mm -hmm. But yeah. sometimes we need to identify those channels. I think there's something, uh, I read uh, someone was answering a question on LinkedIn a few weeks ago, who said something like, go to where your customers are. And I thought that's a really good statement because often we create things to send people to. Why don't we put them where they go already and then we don't have to try and move them. And I think that's something we, we've sort of, we need to work on is, well, what are those channels? How can we put the, the links or the content so we don't have to, yeah, so we might get them there in the end, but we're going to where they normally are. Okay. And, and David, they, there was the book that you mentioned as well, wasn't there? Yeah, so there's the book that Richard Barler wrote, which is Nudge, um, that's available. And also there's a link to the um, Cabinet Office's Mindscape report. That's actually quite interesting for getting those lists of um, thinking patterns or thinking sort of methods that people use and how you might use those. So that's probably worth having a look at too. Excellent. Right. Um, I think we better uh, wrap up there. So I'll just uh, I'll get everyone to stand up. Just to say uh, thank you to the team uh, from Scotland, Standard Life Aberdeen and from Fosway.